All right, I think we're going to get uh, we're going to get started if we can again. I'm trying to keep on keep on schedule. I know people are going to continue to trickle in, but I want to welcome people back. Um, I think you're in for a treat with this next panel. Um, so much of what we've been talking about in terms of medical discovery uh, over the last couple of days now has come about from our ability to use data. It's something you've heard over and over again in these panels: data from genomics, proteomics, metabolics. Um, but how do you Im implement a lot of this data? How do you uh, use it to drive discovery and, uh, and change the way that we think about our healthcare system overall? And how do we build new algorithms? You heard some of that in the last panel or two panels ago, uh, but what does it mean for all of us potentially as patients as well? So first we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Ronald DePino, not Dr. DePinto, as Vice <laughs> President Biden said. Um, <laughs> MD Anderson has a moonshot program, which I, I actually did a story on several years ago before we heard about this most recent moonshot program. He's going to talk about that and what it's doing to more rapidly and efficiently convert the knowledge that we hear about at big name cancer institutions into clinical endpoints for people everywhere that can reduce mortality. After that, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Linda Chin. She's the Associate Vice Chancellor for Health Transformation and the Chief Innovation Officer for Health Affairs at the University of Texas. Rob High is over here to my left. Um, fascinating uh, story, Vice President and Chief Tech Officer for IBM Watson, and Dr. Krishnan Nandabalan, who's the President and Chief Science Officer of BioXL. We're going to talk about aggregated data um, with Dr. Nandabalan and what is needed to make all that data more meaningful. So I think this is going to be a very complete sort of panel, and um, maybe Dr. DePino, do you want to start us off? Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, so we have... Um, an extraordinary opportunity at this moment in history. We've heard a lot about a lot of great discoveries, uh, major conceptual advances, technological capabilities that are really unprecedented. Uh, but I would add that no nature paper, no scientific publication has ever cured a patient. It's only when those discoveries are converted into clinical endpoints, policy, education, that impact on the human condition. So I'm going to tell you about a novel organizational construct that we established at MD Anderson to try to more systematically convert those opportunities into clinical endpoints that make a difference for patients. Anderson is a very large, comprehensive cancer center. We have 21,000 employees, a singular focus on cancer, a global network that uh, influences the care of about one-third of the human population. We have the largest clinical trials engine in the world. About one in three new medicines in cancer are uh, due to MD Anderson's clinical trials engine. So that's a pretty significant enterprise. But the conversion of those opportunities into endpoints is really what the challenge is. So some years ago, we launched our Cancer Moonshot Initiative to try to more systematically make an impact. So again, this relates to this historic <laughs> confluence of knowledge, disruptive technologies, and the fact that we have this global network that could potentially make an impact not just in the United States, but around the world. And so um, we all heard about those major conceptual advances. I think that's best uh, illustrated in these Kaplan-Meier curves where we're not just simply prolonging life, but we're eliciting durable responses and cures in patients. This, is, in fact, is the first patient to go on IPI is now alive 15 years out, and she was on her way to hospice. Uh, in addition, we have uh, big challenges. So Jim Allison's drug from target to FDA approval took 20 years and was almost killed in a number of different uh, transition points. And in fact, about 19 out of 20 drugs that are entering into clinical trials fail. So how do you, what is wrong with this, uh, this relay race of academia and discovery, drug development in pharma, and clinical trials in our hospitals? We think that there is la poor handoff, poor integration, uh, poor coordination and collaboration to really drive those discoveries to endpoints that matter for patients. So we wanted to try to see if we can develop a new organizational paradigm that would allow us to do this more systematically. And so what we did was to, first of all, uh, identify areas of opportunity, find dedicated resources, time, and infrastructure to allow for execution but we also had to establish a new cultural paradigms in an academic organization. We had to celebrate team science and support that through tenure, interinstitutional collaborations, data integration, risk taking with accountability, milestone driven uh, mentality, and perhaps the most important thing is to have professional platforms that allow us to work with academic scholars 
in order to convert knowledge into new drugs, policies, diagnostics, and so on, so that we can have a measurable impact on disease outcomes. So we, in 2012, we asked a very simple question. Is there knowledge in hand today that if simply applied with the right resources and teams, could we accelerate declines in cancer mortality in the next five to 10 years? So we brought together the large uh, confederation of knowledge and capabilities focused on full translation. We identified uh, prevention, detection, and treatment opportunities enabled by adequate funding and these professional platforms. We went through a very rigorous internal and external peer review process. We identified about 50 projects in a half a dozen cancers that represent half of the mortality of cancer, and we launched those programs, and more recently, we launched additional programs. In each of the ones that were launched several years ago, this organizational paradigm has already led to practice changing advances in a number of cancers. I'll just give you one example. In ovarian cancer, by simply sequencing the chemo and the surgery, the Anderson algorithm has converted complete surgical resection frequency from 20% to an astounding 88%. And so many other examples like that, but not just on the treatment side, on the policy side as well. The critical component for this program was the establishment of these platforms. These are not academic scholars. These are professionals that are not focused on publishing papers or writing grants, but on timelines, milestones, deliverables. These are the 10 platforms that we've established, like cancer control or drug development programs or data generation programs or data integration and analysis programs that you'll be hearing about in the course of this hour. Just one very good example is we've done a lot in prevention over the years. We know a lot of the instigators of cancer, but the conversion of that knowledge into policy or K through 12 education or services has been extremely inefficient. We've known, for example, that early childhood sunburns or UV tanning bed use under the age of 18 dramatically increases the risk of melanoma. Yet there are no laws that were established to protect children from getting access to tanning beds. So together with experts in legislative affairs, K through 12 education, and uh, community services that use telementoring, digital uh, capabilities for scalability, we've been able to enact new laws and develop new curriculum for thousands of schools. And so almost half of the states in the United States, for example, now have tanning bed legislation. We're now embarking on efforts in tobacco prevention and cessation, as well as HPV vaccination, all of which are enormous opportunities to actually prevent half of the cancers from happening in the first place. So that's an example of not just writing a prevention paper, but converting that knowledge into new policy, education, and services. Now, in the terms of treating patients, we have this large clinical trials engine, and like many institutions, we would take a snapshot in precision medicine using genomics, proteomics, uh, and uh, immune profiling to try to understand how we should treat those patients. So now what we've done is instead of taking a snapshot, we take a moving picture. And so when patients come in, they get biopsied, but after one dose of treatment, we ask, are the tumors responding? And that allows us to immediately identify biomarkers so that we don't have to waste time for that patient or money on those drugs. And after one dose, we can identify patients who are going to respond, for example, to an immune modulating agent. If that patient doesn't respond, they immediately go on another immune modulating drug, so on and so forth. So this is a longitudinal analysis of patients. And all of these data are captured and integrated uh, into a big data platform with analytics so that we can understand response or lack thereof and begin to push the paradigm in terms of new agents, new combinations, and so on. So I would say that we have already in hand a tremendous amount of knowledge in prevention and in treatment. The biggest challenge that we have worldwide is the knowledge gap. On average, it takes seven years for a practicing community oncologist in the United States to adopt a new standard of care. At great institutions, comprehensive cancer centers like MD Anderson, the next day it becomes the standard of care. Seven years. Very few people have access to the best standards of care, and only two to three percent of patients who are eligible for clinical trials goes on clinical trials. So from my perspective, and the national view and the international view that we have, 
The greatest challenge isn't really the knowledge. We have a tremendous amount of capability today in hand. It's access and it's closing the knowledge gap at the level of providers and at the level of the population so they can understand what causes cancer, what they can do to mitigate risk, and what they can do to uh, and engage in evidence-based screening to catch cancer at its most curable stages. So this is one of the big challenges. Of course, we are very excited that the, this is now a national effort, uh, that uh, cancer finally is a national priority for the United States and the full power of the government and all of its uh, capabilities are gonna be brought to bear on the challenge. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Vice President Biden leading this charge. He is incredibly intelligent, technologically very savvy as well and very passionate, obviously his family has been impacted uh, significantly by this disease. So this is a great day for cancer patients and a really, really bad day for cancer. Thank you very much. Um, let me just ask you a quick follow-up question, uh, Dr. DePina, and then we'll, then we'll move on. Can, can you put this knowledge gap into a little bit more context? Uh, you, you get a lot of patients who come from, uh, to MD Anderson from, community hospitals, for example, and they, I'm sure many of them do a great job, but what do the patients who show up at MD Anderson look like in terms of the way that they've already been treated or diagnosed? So 70% of the patients that we see are not from this, the area. They're from the rest of the United States and around the world. 24% of the diagnoses that come to us are inaccurate. 38% uh, are misstaged. Half of that is about technical inadequacy, and the other half is misinterpretation of the scans. And then if you have all of those things correct, head-to-head, -head, uh, MD Anderson, relative to comprehensive cancer centers, not community, is the mortality uh, statistic differences is about 17% better by five years. So that really, that really that's speaks to knowledge That's a knowledge gap. gap. Um, let, let's move on to your, to your much better half over here to your right, Dr. DePino, Dr. Chin, sitting over here. Um, they're married, by the way, yeah. Um, I, I wonder if you can get, you, you're, you're, um, you're an innovation person at MD Anderson. I wonder if you can give us sort of an idea of how a place like MD Anderson uses data to, to improve healthcare. We talked about this a little bit in the earlier panels, but I want to hear about MD Anderson specifically. Uh, yes, so. Hit that button. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Ron's talk had sort of a perfect segue to what I want to talk about, which is how do we go a step further from that amazing discovery to impact? Um, I think there's no question that we have amazing care, excellence in care and knowledge and expertise in specialty medical centers such as MD Anderson. Uh, but they service <coughs> and take care of very small percentage of patients around the country and even smaller around the world, uh, probably on the order of 2 to 5 percent, depends on how we count them. So, and then you just heard the statistic that suggests that when you're not being treated and managed at a specialty care center like MD Anderson, you as a patient are not getting the optimal care. So if we think about that, not every patient, even as big as MD Anderson is, and it could get 10 times bigger, not every patient can go to MD Anderson because there's simply not enough space and not enough doctor at MD Anderson. And moreover, chances are most of these patients cannot take the time and cannot afford to go to a place like MD Anderson to take care. So the challenge, I think, for us to narrow the gap and, and make sure that the amazing discovery we made in cutting edge science and medicine, translate into population level impact, is to take the care to the patients. In other words, how can we take MD Anderson, in the case of cancer, to all the rural communities and small city around the country so that every patient that's being treated by the community oncologist can get that same level of evidence-based care that is being practiced at MD Anderson. So that's really where we started our efforts to think about what needs to be built from an infrastructure, uh, from a governance and regulatory compliance framework, all the way to analytics that allow us to democratize high quality evidence-based care. Now, today's world, and, and, and we collectively in our partnership have called this our new health system, Health System 2.0. 
And it's really a concept of an ecosystem that surrounds the patient, rather than patient having to go to a hospital or a clinic to get care. And our partnership really includes, and then you will hear from uh, my colleague from IBM Watson uh, on the analytics side, but also with our partner in telecommunication, AT&T, and from services, PricewaterhouseCooper. So I'll tell you about how we evolve and develop this system. If you think about it, we, through our travel, leave bits and pieces of health information about ourselves uh, throughout. And we are mobile these days, so most of us don't live in one single city, in one single town. So you're not talking about data that resides in a few local hospitals. You're talking about data everywhere. Moreover, we also now are beginning to see an explosion in consumer health and, and health-related product and services, such as urgent care center, retail clinics, and health and wellness uh, apps, and wearable devices, the whole concept of quantified cells. That means data, data everywhere, data about us as people, as persons. So it is impractical and impossible when you go see a doctor, that could be in a new city, to expect, expect that doctor to be able to reach out to every single place you've been and get the data about you, or for that matter, for you to record every detail about your own history and recite it precisely and accurately at the moment of need. So what we thought, one of the first things we have to do is build a cloud infrastructure that allow us to aggregate this data. But it has to be more than electronic health record data because what contains in the EHR is your clinical history, your medical uh, information. But we want to know about you, not as a medical diagnosis. The best personalized treatment will come when the doctors understand you as a person. And that means we have to aggregate data outside of the health industry. We got to understand your behavior and environment, your social environment, your quantified self. So we need a neutral platform that cuts across industry and be able to aggregate data from sources that are inherently non-interoperable, but make them aggregated and usable as, a, as one. And I'll come back to that more. But on one hand, we all say we want more data. But the minute we get the data, our human brains, you know, get overwhelmed. We really can't deal with the data. So having data alone is not enough. We need to think about the kind of analytic that's necessary to organize, synthesize, and make the data relevant to the context, make the data intuitive, uh, I should say, the information intuitive to the user so that it is actually actionable at the point of care. And, and that means we need to collaborate with uh, those leaders in the industry of analytic. In particularly, we focus on cognitive analytic in partnership with IBM Watson because I believe that the nuance that tells us about the medical conditions and tells us about the person lives in the unstructured documentation. And we need to be able to understand and extract information from that. However, we just heard about the knowledge gap. It's great and it's necessary to understand your patient, but it is also necessary for the provider in that community setting to have the knowledge and expertise to treat that problem properly. And that's where we also begin to think about how to aggregate knowledge and develop expert system uh, so that the best at the places like MD Anderson can be captured and democratized uh, and, and shared so that more patients can benefit from that. And also research. Clinical trial being an example. How can we expand the accrual and increase the kind of data we can generate and incorporate that research information into everyday care so that we speed and shorten the gap between research and care. And that's important, and I bring that up specifically because there are regulatory implications, as you can imagine. These are data are highly regulated. It required the data structure, it required the control built into the system, uh, are specifically developed so that it allow for this to happen. And that led me to the other point. Healthcare is highly regulated for good reason, for the most part, I think. Um, so we need to have a system that provides security because that security is absolutely necessary for patients to be willing to allow their data to be shared 
and for every care provider and the care institution to be willing to take on, uh, uh, to mitigate the risk and liability they, sh they have by allowing the data to be shared. So with that, we partner with AT&T in this case to develop a dedicated network so that every piece of information that's on this system will not be open to the open internet. It is uh, the transmission and uh, use both um, on the wire and the wireless portion is contained so that we can max maximize the benefit of mobility in, uh, uh, in the healthcare world. So with this infrastructure put together over the last three, almost four years in partnership with this industry leader, we now have to now deal with a really, really important piece to build an ecosystem, the technology serves as a framework to link them together and bring all these pieces together. But we need to put in place a governance framework so that we can make sure the appropriate controls are in place, that there is a shared operation that allows seamless transition of the patient and their information from one provider to the next, and the contracts and contractual terms that are necessary to formalize these risks and liabilities. And to demonstrate that we can actually do that, uh, we have taken this infrastructure to South Texas, to the poorest city in the US, um, where there's rampant diabetes, and show how we can use the technology framework to create an ecosystem and put this governance structure around it so that it can operate to provide more access and more affordable access to basic and preventative care in a population that's uh, mostly uninsured. Now, I talk about also um, learning, and in that respect, we also, as you heard, MD Anderson stood up an instance of this healthcare information interchange that has the level of fine-grained control to allow for linkage in real time of clinical data longitudinally with research data, particularly genomic and immune-based profiling. And this um, translational research accelerator is currently active and containing all of the active patient at MD Anderson, over 250,000. Now, if you look at the ecosystem in the middle, you can see that it's a highly distributed system, and therefore, uh, we need to have some level of consistency and quality standard. And that's where the expert system come in. Uh, a cognitive system to capture expertise and support provider at all level of the licensure so that they can provide evidence-based care. And with that, I'm gonna show you a demo of the system we built for the oncology uh, uh, solution called Oncology Expert Advisor so that it gives you a sense of how cognitive analytic can be applied to uh, enhance our ability to understand the patient and, and interpret and understand medical knowledge so that together we support the best evidence-based decision by um, This is a video by recording of a live demonstration of MD Anderson Oncology Expert Advisor a cognitive clinical decision support system. This short demo highlights a subset of OEA capabilities. It was run against a live database of approximately 15,000 active patients, but featuring only patients who have consented for demonstration purposes. The patient's names, dates of birth, and photos have been altered, but all other data and information in the demo is real. OEA is trained by MD Anderson experts to read a patient's medical record and surface key attributes pertinent to clinical decisions. As you see here, this is Sanderson Haywood, a 46-year-old male diagnosed with stage 4 metastatic lung cancer. Whenever a piece of information is interpreted from unstructured text documentation, the blue hyperlink brings you to the source documentation so you can verify the accuracy of OEA's interpretation. Sequencing of Mr. Haywood's tumor has identified an EGFR gene mutation. OEA has called out the fact that this EGFR mutation has changed to a specific mutation that imparts resistance to first-generation EGFR inhibitor therapies. OEA synthesizes and organizes complex information into intuitive, useful views. For example, one can get a point-in-time snapshot of the patient's status based on a synthesized, up-to-date synopsis, medication list, and other health information. Or in the timeline view, in addition to basic laboratories, one can get a chronological view of the molecular sequencing result at diagnosis, 
corresponding treatment decision, and patient response. A core capability of OEA is its treatment option recommendation. For example, OEA identifies nivolumab, a new immune checkpoint drug, as an FDA-approved option for Mr. Haywood. Every treatment option suggested by OEA is linked to supporting evidence, as shown here, so the oncologist can determine whether this drug is right for his or her patient. OEA also organizes reported adverse events and contraindications, so the physician does not have to spend valuable time searching for that important information. OEA also tracks the response and toxicity profiles observed in the actual population OEA is assisting. It does so automatically by analyzing both structured and unstructured data in the medical records to highlight not just known adverse events associated with this drug, but all adverse events experienced by patients on this therapy. This is where one can begin to learn in the real world setting toxicity that may be different than in a clinical trial setting. For a new drug like Nevo, there is generally little experience in its use. Therefore, when a clinician considers this therapy, OEA provides a checklist to help make sure that all relevant laboratory tests have been evaluated prior to or are being monitored during therapy. Standard of care treatments are, unfortunately, not curative for the majority of patients. The good news is we are getting smarter about how to develop better therapies faster. Therefore, OEA automatically screens every patient against open clinical trials at clinicaltrials.gov to encourage consideration by the patient and physician. A core functionality of OEA is care pathways as advisory information to practicing oncologists. It shares the clinical experience of a specialist with a generalist so patients can benefit from the best and newest therapies, even if they are not being treated at a subspecialty center like MD Anderson. Here's an example of guidance to support the management of skin reaction on EGFR therapy. Finally, making the right treatment decision for a patient is great, but only if the patient has been appropriately diagnosed and staged. Therefore, OEA is built with a diagnostic workup algorithm based on literature and guidelines, so it can support practicing oncologists to make accurate diagnosis and staging for patients, consistent with best practices at MD Anderson. Good. Um, let, let, let me, I'm going to get to Mr. High in a second. Let me just ask a quick question. We'll come back, uh, Linda, in a second. What, how would you characterize the, the future relationship between MD Anderson and many of these local community hospitals? Is this, is this something to help bolster up their care? What, what is the relationship uh, intended to be like? So I think for a cent that's what we call them, a center of excellence that will be developing these expert system, and we're doing the same thing for diabetes, for example. It's really the same concept. It creates a relationship with different level of care providing institutions so that from a patient's perspective, they see this as a seamless continuum of care so that there is a rationale and evidence-based reason for them to go to the local primary care doctor or when they have to travel to go see a specialist. It should not be based on mean only. It really should be based on the medical need of the patient. And I think if we can create this ecosystem where all different level of care capabilities are connected, then we can optimally util utilize the most valuable resource and the most expensive resource in healthcare, which is our experts. Um, Mr. High, you know, I'm fascinated by IBM Watson. I think a lot of people in this room probably are. Uh, I'm really curious about, it, it seems to have a really unique seat at, at this table in, in terms of this discussion, being able to look at the data, uh, and you and I wrote, both wrote down data everywhere as Linda was talking about it. How, how, do you, how does IBM Watson look at that data? What does it mean for healthcare? And who, who does IBM Watson or, or, or you, your organization, who do they partner with in things like this? So let me also make clear that there are two segments of data that, that's relevant to us in the world, uh, data that we refer to as being structured uh, and data that we refer to as being unstructured. And of course, the tradition of computing has been to work on structured data. It's what does quite well. I think there was a discussion on that earlier today about the need to convert data into something that's structured so that computers can work well with it. But that actually only represents about 20% of the data in the world. The other 80% 
is forms of human expression. That's why I sometimes refer to it as a human condition. Um, why? Well, because humans still prefer to communicate with each other in natural language. Uh, we still prefer to write things down in natural language. We still prefer to uh, express our ideas, uh, our thoughts, uh, our understanding, our observations using natural language. And because of that, that represents the prevalence of information that's out there. So the key that Watson brings to the table is its ability to decipher, to be able to understand, to be able to get to the real intention of those expressions, even when those expressions have not been quantified. It's really the qualif qualified information that we think is most important. I think Linda referred to that uh, in her discussion as well. Uh, so Watson is there to interpret that language, the, the unstructured information, um, to get to its root meaning, and then apply it in the various different approaches that we've described here, ultimately to give expertise to the end uh, provider of healthcare. Um, and our partnerships um, have uh, ranged from the work that we've done with MD Anderson, work we're doing with uh, the TMC, with the uh, DT system down in, in uh, South Texas, uh, work that we've done with Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, and then a slew of other partners in, in the whole world of big data analytics. Could you give us a little bit of an overview of how it works? I mean, how IBM Watson looks at big data. And, you know, one of the earlier panels, this whole signal to noise ratio came up. How do you determine what is important? Uh, what are the important correlations? Yeah. So the fundamental underlying technology is what we call machine learning. Uh, that's transitioning into a new technology that we call deep learning, both of which are attempting to evaluate signals in the data set and look for patterns of meaning based on having been trained to look for those patterns. And training, of course, occurs by taking prior examples and using that to give the system enough um, understanding or you know, examples that it can follow from which it can identify future patterns of meaning. Uh, in the case of language, those are based on linguistic signals. Uh, and one of the novel breakthroughs that we had in the case of Watson was to look at the problem of language not as a series of words and attempting to look up the definition, the dictionary definition of each word as we use it or to try to map that into a grammatically precise representation of expression, but rather to use the language as we use it and to understand it much the way that we as human beings understand it, which is to say we look for patterns, we look for groupings of words, we look for uh, sentence structures, uh, we look for the the semantics that can be derived from all the linguistic devices that we use, including all the way down to things like the way that we punctuate or how we use capitalization uh, or the way, the way we draw out space within the expression, uh, at least in the textual space, and then likewise in the visual and the auditory space as well. So I don't know, I don't know if you had a, a presentation at all, but, but I'm, I'm curious when you, because people think of IBM Watson for, I mean, it's gotten this reputation in the lay community for all sorts of things, but with regard to healthcare specifically, that unstructured data, that 80%, how, how are you looking at that data? How is it benefiting the average person? Yeah, so first of all, let me back up to say, and I'm going to skip over my charts because I think we'll say everything we need to say here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, we played the game of Jeopardy in February 2011, uh, five <laughs> years ago. And yes, that was a game, and yes, there was publicity that we got from it, but it, primarily it was about demonstrating the idea that we could read literature. In the case of Jeopardy, um, Watson had to read 200 million pages of literature in three seconds to be able to derive answers, to come up with answers that were pertinent to the question being asked. And of course, as Linda alluded to, that has to be contextual. Right, you can't answer questions reading literature, you can't understand the question without understanding the context of that question and applying that, much the same with what we do as humans as well. If you think about most of our ambiguity within language, it, it is resolved by having contextual history and a background that allows us to use our shared knowledge to, to resolve ambiguities. <coughs> um, so ever since then, we stopped playing games. Uh, in fact, it turned out almost the day after we played the game of Jeopardy, the, the people who were calling us were doctors because they realized very quickly that they have the same fundamental problem. There are on the order of about 2.5 uh, exabytes of data being produced every single day. 2.5 billion, billion characters of data being produced every single day. 
uh, if you're having trouble imagining that and, and kind of carry on the theme that we had yesterday about Harry Potter, that represents about 625 billion Harry Potter books being written every single day. Now, of course, not all of that is textual. A lot of it is. Uh, some of it is visual. It's media. It's, it's images. It's videos. It's also audio. And a lot of that's also the data coming off of machines that are generating sensory results or, or, or uh, evaluations. So our application of cognitive computing is in any of those spaces where trying to interpret that data requires sort of a human style of thinking. And we use cognitive computing basically to embody some of the cognitive processes that we as humans em employ to understand that information and then try to identify and draw a sense from it, which gives us the opportunity to apply that not only in the medical, history, uh, medical practices, uh, but also in retail and uh, actually more recently in the area of weather which might be a little bit surprising, but we did buy the weather company precisely because there was so much that we could bring to that weather analysis using cognitive computing techniques, and on and on and on. Just about every industry um, has an opportunity for us to apply this, again, because so much of the data that we deal with as humans are in a form that only humans have been able to understand up until now. I'm going to get to Nandu next here in just one second, but let me just ask you finally, uh, Mr. High, what, what is your biggest worry when you think about uh, integrating IBM Watson and the way that it analyzes data into healthcare? So, of course, you know, the most important thing for us is to get quality training data because the system learns just like humans do, and if taught with bad information, it will learn the habits of that bad information. So it's very important that we get good quality information, which is one of the reasons why we partner with people like MD Anderson is because they bring their clinical expertise to the table. When we can bring the best doctors um, in that setting to the table and draw from their understanding of the information and capture that by training the system to recognize the patterns that they're looking for, then it gives us the opportunity, as, as both Ron and Linda talked about, to democratize that expertise out to people who, by virtue of not having as much exposure or maybe having more variation or diversity of the kind of information they have to deal with, don't, quite, don't build up quite the same level of expertise. Um, uh, Nandu, let, let me ask you, when you hear these, these conversations about data specifically, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to BioXL in the world of drug uh, development, for example? A um, couple of things. One is that, like Rob said, um, the amount of data that is available these days is mind-boggling. It kind of doubles every year. Um, and you're supposed to keep track of it, make sense out of it, and use it in a very complex process like drug discovery and development. So you're, you're essentially trying to recover signal from noise. Um, and the more successful you are at doing that, the faster you reach your goal, which is getting a drug approved. And uh, it is, uh, you know, that's where I see the biggest promise of big data applications. And actually asking these questions um, in an iterative or recursive manner that you can quickly cut through the noise and arrive at the signal. Do, 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 you, have, do you have examples of yes, what this might yes. look like? Uh, just when you use the data to, to mm -hmm. accelerate that? Yeah. Yep. So um, let me see if I can get this. Be sure and jump over my charts there. Yeah. OK. OK, so um, for the past two days, uh, you folks have listened to um, all the varied types of uh, data and uh, information that's used by scientists and clinicians in, uh, you know, discovering their, uh, d d discovering novel therapeutic agents. Um, and this can be varied. It can be molecular. Um, and I've listed, uh, if you, the outer circle, I've listed here some of those. Uh, you can talk about the genetic, genomic, uh, proteomic information. I've just, uh, just for the simplicity's sake, I've listed 20,000 genes, but it could be 200,000 RNAs, uh, 10 times as many proteins, and uh, all of the interactions between these things. Um, if you're thinking about drugs in play, it's not just the approved drugs. It's all those drugs that are being tested and all the different varied formulations of those drugs that are at play here um, every day. In, uh, in PubMed Central and in PubMed, there are more than 5,000 papers that come in, um, of which if you actually just look for cancer, it's about um, between 600 and 700 papers every day. But that's when you search just for the word cancer. 
if you if you want to uh, search for the underlying mechanisms of cancer, it's uh, almost you know three or four times that. And that's every day. Um, and similarly, if you want to look at the number of diseases, um, we have had a lot of discussion about the rare diseases. Uh, there are anywhere between 7,000 to 9,000 of them, depending on how you count them. Uh, but then you add common diseases to it, and you, 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 there are a lot of common shared symptoms, which is why you should not think of a rare disease as a rare disease. Um, the, the, the pathology, the molecular pathology is a shared, so you have to actually, if you don't understand the disease, how are you going to cure it, right? So uh, big data, uh, you know, so uh, someone asked me this morning, what is big data? Well, data is data, so what is big about it? Uh, it really is, it refers to real world data, um, unstructured data that needs to be queried at source. So, you know, when, when I was part of the Human Genome Project uh, oh so many years ago, we spent time uh, gathering the data, curating it, you know, uh, go through this process called extraction, transformation, and loading a database so that then you can ask questions of the database. Uh, you can't do that to uh, uh, data that's all varied in source of this. So, so really the, 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 the key here is the synthesis of knowledge from all of these varied sources of data that is presented in, uh, um, in what Dr. Chin referred to as actionable uh, format, and we refer to it in BioExcel as a da metadata or dashboard, right? So you want to, you want to ac access big data, query it, synthesize knowledge from it, build metadata sets, present it as a user dashboard to the experts, to the drug developers, to the clinicians, so that they can make uh, de decisions that only they can make because they have the expertise to do so. So, so that, that is the process that we follow in utilizing big data drug discovery. Now at BioExcel we have a pretty unique uh, uh, way of that we got into this because for the past decade or so we have been advising pharmaceutical companies on how to optimize their drug pipelines through algorithmic approaches. And um, I'm not sure if it was the jeopardy that uh, uh, influenced me, but certainly Watson did start me thinking on the path that, you know, the, the critical thing is to understand the context. And by understanding context, the relationship between these things, uh, uh, genes, drugs, diseases, uh, mechanisms, and by, by doing that, you know, I ask the question, how are these related? How does the molecular pathology arise? Um, how do we decipher patterns? Uh, how do we uh, separate our signal from noise? If you, you know, sensitivity and specificity is everything in life. Uh, if you make the process too specific, you may actually miss out on things. And in a discovery process, when you're trying to find a new drug, you don't want to miss out anything. But if you make it too loose, if you, lose, if you want to make it too sensitive, you will lose out specificity, and thereby you, you will spend time, uh, you'll spend time drifting around in a morass of data. And, and so that, that's what you don't want. And finally, all of this is useful from, uh, uh, you know, from a business perspective and from a patient perspective, uh, only if you, you know, in this case, uh, are successful in getting drugs developed and approved, otherwise, it's just an interesting intellectual exercise, uh, which may have value, but we are here to actually develop drugs. So um, th this, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, in it's, it's fascinating that, you know, uh, we all refer to the space program. I mean, you call it moonshot. I saw Apollo somewhere. Uh, Ap Apollo trim is our process. Perhaps the space program represents uh, the ultimate, uh, you know, a a a a, you know, expression of human endeavor and perseverance. So uh, I, I find it quite interesting. Well, TRIM stands for Targeted Recursive Interactive Mapping, and uh, it's, it's more than just a, 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 a catchy acronym. Essentially, we create these metadata sets. So you can think of a disease repository that uh, looks at all of the disease uh, phenotypes, uh, the, the latest guidelines, uh, EMR, EHR data, the clinical trials data, you can think of the molecular repository, which has all the, all, all the pathways, the genes, the genomic, the proteomic data. And you can have the literature repository uh, that uh, refers to all the knowledge that is uh, built up that connects the disease to the underlying molecular pathology. And when you actually 
distill the targets that are important, you come up with a target repository that tells you, okay, if you go after these targets, you can actually uh, begin to solve a disease. Uh, and then the drug repository refers to the agents that are going to be used for that. Uh, what are the mechanisms of actions? Uh, and it's not just looking at the obvious connection. So, so the low-hanging fruit is always good, right? If you have a kinase as a target in a cancer, and if you have a kinase inhibitor, then that's fine. But probably someone has already thought of it. That's why it's there in the literature. But what if you can find uh, an effector of the kinase that has only been published in a, a related disease uh, and has never been implicated in a tumor, but if you, if you synthesize all of this together, you can develop a hypothesis which can be tested. Uh, this doesn't happen uh, by itself. Uh, you need uh, an interaction between the expert user, usually you know, a pharmaceutical scientist, a, a cancer biologist, a rheumatologist, whatever specialty you're dealing with, and the data scientist, <laughs> and this process is iterative and recursive. Uh, the great thing uh, co uh, compared to what it used to be when I was a graduate student is you can ask these questions on a daily basis, and next day you come and there is an answer waiting for you, and you can test the hypothesis again and again and again till you, uh, till you get it almost perfectly right so that you don't enter experimentation phase till you're sure of all of your facts and hypotheses. And that is what I've seen the biggest uh, uh, benefit of actually uh, using big data. Now, uh, it's not just that uh, this is an interesting way of approaching drug development. We actually collaborate with uh, our partners like Takeda and Pronutria and Centraxion in their specific programs. Uh, and they use our technology to fine tune, uh, select the uh, appropriate patient segment for their agents. Uh, or uh, select appropriate disease for their uh, technology. Um, but we also used it to develop our own um, pipeline. 18 months ago, we were a pure play analytics company applying our algorithms to uh, fine tune pipelines of other, uh, our partners. We made a uh, strategic dis decision to enter immuno-oncology simply because we saw so much knowledge being generated uh, so we screened for all of um, the, uh, you know, the pharmacological universe for, for compounds that would have immunomodulatory properties, and then went about understanding what would be the impact of using the, these agents in different tumors uh, in combination with the accepted um, <laughs> immuno-oncology agents like nivolumab. Uh, and now we have a pipeline, uh, BXCL701 is an oral immunomodulator that actually has a uh, significant impact on the tumor microenvironment. Uh, it's going to enter the clinic at the end of this uh, year. And we have two more agents that are currently undergoing preclinical testing, which have shown a very good synergistic uh, activity in combination with uh, the existing uh, immuno-oncology agents. We also use this process in uh, Orphan uh, diseases, especially focused on CNS, because there's a high degree of unmet need in the CNS area. And we have an agent that's entering acute agitation and um, uh, related disorders due to neurodegeneration. Uh, and I would, I would just close with saying that um, the, the biggest promise that we see is uh, we have a, an enormous existing body of data. Uh, if we uh, can exploit it to the maximum, uh, we can cut down uh, the, the time it takes to develop a drug from the eight to 12 years that you heard to maybe four to five years if you work with compounds that currently are stuck in phase two for the lack of efficacy but are otherwise perfectly safe. And furthermore, if you're gonna start with a compound that's already proven safe in man, uh, you actually cut down, the, you, you, you're building off, or you're leveraging the 50 to $75 million that has already been spent on that. So, you know, we can't continue to develop drugs uh, that, that are going to cost a billion dollars per drug, and we can't wait 10 to 12 years to, you know, make another drug. So really, what we're using big data is to be disruptive in uh, drug discovery and development, uh, and that, I see, is the most... Uh, biggest impact of applying big data. That's great. Thank you very much. You know, Rob, when I, when I told my dad I wanted to go into neurosurgery, 
He said, I don't, know, I don't know if that's a good idea. I think a robot's gonna replace you in about 10 years or so. And um, as I hear you guys talk about this, I'm, I'm curious the, the, the sort of interface between big data and intuition, scientific intuition, that human element. You sort of alluded to this, but, but what about that? Um, what, what, what are things that big data cannot replace uh, uh, when you talk about drug discovery or anything else in healthcare? Well, it's very hard to uh, replace human imagination, as you said, intuition, although intuition is somewhat a codification of certain logic that we've, uh, that we've assimilated over time, but nonetheless, uh, it's very difficult for a cognitive system or for anybody to replicate empathy and compassion and actually motivation. So there's a lot. There's a lot that we'll never replace humans with, or if we do, it'll be so far out in time that it's almost irrelevant. But I don't think that that's something that is, um, is, should be our focus. Our focus needs to be on how we use cognitive systems like every other tool that has ever been invented, which is to amplify our human ability, uh, whether that is to do the research for us, to find the information that's relevant to any decision we want, might want to make, whether it is capturing expertise and just redistributing it for other people to use at the point that they make their decisions, uh, whether it is to attempt to interpret at a level of acuity that mm -hmm. is difficult for the human senses to pick up. Uh, there's lots and lots of opportunity for us to exploit that as a tool. Uh, but that is what it is. It is a tool. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. It's a fascinating discussion, but Nandu, Rob, Ron, Linda, please uh, give them a warm, warm round of applause. Thank you.